everything's fine. Hey guys, it's Sarah and today we are going to talk about all the books that I read in the month of August. So I don't have a ton. I have six, I think, which for the way that the month went, <laughs> I'm going to say that's pretty good. I definitely hit probably a week, week and a half where I really just wasn't reading anything. I was very tired. I was feeling a little down. Uh, we had some stuff going on with my dog, with his health. He's fine right now. Um, but it took up a lot of my brain space and a lot of my energy. And I just wasn't reading quite as much or even really anything at all. So that being said, I still did read six books. And I'm going to let you know what I thought. And something I'm going to do going forward since I have been turmoiling with my collection and how big it is and moving and all that stuff. I do regularly unhaul books and I don't usually do unhaul videos a whole lot. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But I think moving on from here, I've had a lot of interest in um, talking more about what I'm unhauling and why I'm unhauling them and how I come to those decisions. So I think what I'm gonna do moving forward is in my monthly wrap ups, I will let you know what I'm planning to keep and what I'm planning to unhaul. Because that's usually how I unhaul books. I don't go through my books and get rid of a bunch of stuff at one time. I usually do right before we move. Other than that, not really. So it's usually on a monthly basis. And I just take all the books that I read that month and any of the books that I don't want to keep I put into a box. And then when that box is full, I donate it. That's usually how it all goes. So I think in my wrap ups now, I'm going to let you know what the fate of that book is that I'm talking about that I read and let you know if I'm going to keep it or if I'm going to unhaul it. So I think that's what I'm going to do moving forward. And I hope that will help you guys see what my reasonings are behind keeping them or not keeping them. And it'll probably help me as well, to be honest. The first book I read was actually on my Kindle, and that is The Marsh King's Daughter by Karen Dion. This is one of my five-star predictions, so I'm going to save my rating and my overall thoughts and stuff for our follow-up when we do that, but I'll give you a synopsis of it. So this is an adult book that is following a woman who grew up in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. She lived out in the literally middle of nowhere, <laughs> in the wilderness, no one was around. She knew her mom and her dad, and that was it. And they grew up living off the land in some very interesting circumstances. That's all I'm going to say, because I went into this not really knowing much about this book at all. And I'm happy that I did that. So if you haven't read this book and you haven't heard much about it, I want you to go into it that way as well. But it's a dual timeline. It follows this girl, Helena, as a child and how she grew up with her parents in the situation that they were in, how they survived, all that good stuff. And then you also follow her as an adult and something is happening in her life as an adult that is bringing all of those childhood memories back and she's being forced to face some things that happened. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Go into it blind if you haven't read it yet and be ready for some brutality. It's brutal. It was a lot more graphic than I was expecting, but I appreciated it. And there are definite content warnings in here for um, abuse, lots of abuse, both domestic and child. And there is also some animal abuse that happens in this book as well. So if that's something you're not comfortable with, there's definitely that in there too. Uh, I was not ready for all of that. That kind of stuff doesn't um, affect me, but if it affects you, just be warned about that. And since that one was a Kindle book, I don't have to unhaul it because it's on my Kindle. Okay, so the first physical book that I read in the month of August was Cinder, and this is by Marissa Meyer. This is the first book in the Lunar Chronicles series. I buddy read this with Krista and Amanda and Lindsay, and there is a big buddy like read along group happening as well. Um, I didn't personally join the group because it's on Discord and I just don't do Discord. Um, so I just kind of talked to my friends about it <laughs> along the way. So, um, but this one is a young adult science fiction retelling of Cinderella. And, okay, 
I loved it. <laughs> um, I was a little worried that I wasn't going to love it as much because it is young adult and sometimes you can go into it and, you know, as an adult myself, it's a little harder, but I really did like this book a lot. I thought it was really, really creative. So Cinder is our main character. She is a cyborg. So she is half human, half robot. And she was obviously not born that way. She became that. And in this world, there's a pandemic. So I wasn't prepared for that. I did not know that that was something that was in here. So that took me by surprise, but I still really enjoyed it. It didn't like, you know, with what's going on today, it's, it was fine for me. And there's a pandemic that's happening. And Cinder is living in these circumstances where her father has passed away. She is living with her stepmother and her two stepsisters. And so you're definitely getting the parallels there with the Cinderella story with like the evil stepmother and all that stuff. So that's definitely a thing. She's the workhorse of the family. She is a very talented mechanic. And a lot of people seek her out to fix their robots and their droids and, you know, anything mechanical that needs to be fixed, she can do it, basically. She's very sought after. One day, she's in her shop and she gets paid a visit by the prince. And he needs his robot to be fixed because there's something inside this robot's brain that he needs. And um, he goes to Cinder to try to ask for her help to do that. Meanwhile, there's this pandemic going on and, you know, they're trying to keep that under control. There is also an enemy of the people in this country and it, they live on a planet and they are called Lunars and they are basically threatening to go to war with the people of this country. And so there's a lot of political things happening in here as well with um, the prince and with the people of Lunar and their queen. And there was so much happening. And I really, really enjoyed this, you guys. I did settle on a four stars. It wasn't quite a five star. It wasn't, you know, like mind blowing or anything, but I thought it was very creative. I could definitely see the Cinderella parallels in here. And I didn't see a lot of things coming, which I was really, really happy about. So definite recommendation. If you haven't read the Lunar Chronicles and you do like young adult, I would say give it a try because me as a almost 43 year old woman, I really enjoyed it. And this is one I'm definitely going to be keeping on my shelves. Um, I think that my daughter Kaylin would really like this as well. And yeah, so keeping this one. Next book I picked up was Malibu Rising. This is by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This one I listened to on audiobook. The audiobook narrator is Julia Whalen, who is one of my favorites. She's fantastic. This is an adult contemporary that follows the Rivas family, and it mainly follows the four children that are in this family. So it is Nina, Jay, Hud, and Kit, and they are all siblings. Their parents are very famous. Uh, they were very famous in like the 70s, 80s type. This book is told in dual timelines. So you are following a present timeline, which is following the four children as they are adults and they are living in Malibu and they are hosting this party that happens every year. It's a really big party. It, Hollywood elite shows up. Everybody wants to be invited to this party. It's a huge deal. And this party is going to be happening. And in the present timeline, you are getting told the story by the hour. So you're seeing what's happening in different hours leading up to this party. We also flash back to the four children as they are children and seeing them grow up with their parents, what's happening with their parents. Their dad is Nick Rivas, who is a character that is from, he shows up, I believe, in both of her previous books, Evelyn Hugo, he was briefly married to, so he is in that book. And then he also showed up in Daisy Jones and the Six very briefly. And so he is in the music business, obviously, in Hollywood. He's very famous and very well known. So in the past, you're getting the story based on the year. So it goes through the years and some decades and stuff. And so you're going back and forth between the present in one day and the past across decades as you are seeing Nick being a father to them, what their life was like, how they grew up, all that stuff. And then in the present timeline, all of a lot of their childhood is coming up 
leading up to this party as well. So it all kind of like weaves together really nicely. Basically by the end of this book, and this is in the synopsis, the house will be where the party is, is going to go up in flames. So that is kind of what everything is leading up to. And I loved this book. <laughs> I gave it five stars. I thought it was fantastic. It was very, very entertaining, very entertaining. It was just like Hollywood drama, juicy, all that good stuff. There's a lot of fun little tidbits thrown in there that just make it fun to read and fun to follow along with. I loved the siblings. I loved Nina. And Nina was a very different character than I was expecting her to be going in. I was really expecting her to be some snotty rich girl in Malibu who doesn't have to worry about money. So she's just whatever. And she treats people terribly and blah, blah, blah. That was not Nina at all. I loved her as a character. I thought she was fantastic. And seeing the things that happened in her childhood to make her who she was in the present was great. I loved it. So I like that so much about this book. Um, I liked that you didn't really know what was going to be the outcome still until like the very end. I thought that was great. So it really kind of kept you guessing like what's going to happen here. And it was just so much fun. So much fun. Highly recommend the audiobook if you are an audiobook listener and it was just a great time. And again, I gave it five stars and I'm definitely keeping this one. After that audiobook, I wanted another one and I wanted something kind of short, something I could get through really quickly. And I went ahead and picked up Kindness and Wonder by Gavin Edwards. This is a biography about Mr. Rogers. And the whole tagline behind this is why Mr. Rogers matters more now than ever. So it's very short, and again, I listened to it on audio. It is narrated by Jeremy Arthur. And, okay, I have kind of mixed feelings about this one because I grew up loving Mr. Rogers. I watched him as a kid and just, I loved his show. I thought he was great. And this, it... It's very interesting. I did enjoy learning more about Mr. Rogers and his background, how he came to be on television, and just overall what type of message he wanted to convey and how important he thought children were and how important he thought making everybody feel included and loved and all that stuff was. I did not know that he was actually an ordained minister. I didn't know that, so I thought that was really interesting. He was very deeply grounded in his faith. And but there were parts in here as well that I kind of felt like the author was criticizing him a bit, um, a bit unfairly. And it was mostly, you know, there was Mr. Rogers is a person who, you know, there's a very famous now scene where he was um, on his show. He was cooling his feet off in a pool of water because it was very hot. And then um, he invited his neighbor to come over and to share the pool with him and his neighbor was black. And I guess it had never really been, been done on television at that time where a white man and a black man were sharing, you know, something like that. And so that was very impactful. Um, but I still felt like the author criticized him for not being inclusive enough. And I was just kind of like, but really? <laughs> so um, I don't know. It was, it was just kind of like that. And I don't know, I guess, I ended up settling on a three stars for this one because I did enjoy learning about Mr. Rogers. And the thing from this book that's going to stick with me the most is the way that Fred Rogers interacted with his fans. There were multiple, multiple stories in here about him talking to his fans and talking to them as if no one else is around and really making sure he's connecting with people, whether they're children or whether they're adults, it doesn't matter to him. If they were a fan of his and he was approached or he was called or he was written to, he took the time to connect with his fans. And I think that's something that's so special and something that is just not done today anymore. There was one story in particular about a little girl who was having seizures and one of the only times that she was not seizing so much, you know, to a point where it was very dangerous was when she was watching his show and she was about to undergo um, 
a big surgery, I think a brain surgery. And her mother reached out to Mr. Rogers just to say, you know, if you could just keep her in your prayers and in your thoughts, she's a huge fan and all this stuff. This man called their family and talked to her on the phone for hours. And when she had her surgery, he called the hospital to check up on her every day. And she was having complications after the surgery. He went to the hospital and sat by her bed for two weeks until she woke up. He was one of the first people that she saw when she woke up. Who does that? <laughs> like, I don't know of a single personality on television today that would do something like that. Like, it's just, it was uncanny to me. And I just went, oh my gosh, it just touched my heart so much. So that's something that's definitely going to stick with me through this one. For the long haul, I am going to go ahead and unhaul this one because I don't think it's something I'll ever reread. And I don't think I need to have it on my shelves, but I did enjoy learning more about him. And then you guys, I picked up this book. Mm, I picked up Amari and the Night Brothers. And I had set this aside after we moved. When I was unpacking my books, I set this aside immediately because I was like, you know what? I just really, really want to read this book. And then the buzzword for the month of August was time of day. So night is in the title. So I use this for the buzzword challenge for the month of August. So that worked out really nicely. And this is a middle grade book written by B.B. Alston. And I loved this so much. I've been hearing a lot of hype about it, so I was very excited to read it, but I was afraid that it was like, is this going to be an overhyped thing? It is not. This is worth all the hype. So Amari is living in a part of town that is pretty run down. You know, there's a lot of government housing, you know, things like that. There's a lot of gang activity in her neighborhood. So she's not living in like the best part. However, she is going to a very exclusive school at the same time. And she is getting into the school because she's very smart. Her brother was also very smart. And uh, she's dealing with some bullying at the school. So there is definitely a content warning for some bullying in here. And that does happen throughout the book as well. But Amari's older brother has gone missing. His name is Quentin and he has graduated from, you know, school and everything and he is in the workforce, but he goes missing and they do not know where he is. They have no idea. They are still searching, but they're not finding any clues or hints as to where he is. Amari gets sent home from school one day after an incident and she is paid a visit by a very strange man. She has no idea what's going on. He claims that he has a message from her brother and she's very confused because her brother is missing. They don't know where she is. So she's thinking, you know, have they found him? And he has a very special message for her. So she reads it and she ends up discovering that there is a briefcase hidden in his closet and inside of it is an invitation to the Bureau of Supernatural Affairs. She has no idea what this is. <laughs> what do you mean supernatural affairs? Because we all know supernatural means otherworldly creatures, things like that. She doesn't believe in any of that. Um, her mind gets changed. She accepts this invitation because she believes that this is going to lead her to her brother and what happened to him and where he is. She's determined to find him. Come to find out, she goes to this building where the invitation leads her to and finds out that there is an entire league of supernatural affairs and she is being put in to be a part of it and to try out for it because you have to actually qualify for it. And from there you pick a job or a career or whatever, and then you start training in that. And then you still have to pass tests in order to even be part of all this. And if you don't pass anything and you get kicked out or whatever, your memory gets wiped and you go back home. So you have no recollection of it. So we follow Amari through her adventures in this world and all the while she is searching for her brother. So I went into this, even though I'd heard so much about this book, I went into this just not realizing it was gonna be so much of what I love in one book and that is definitely what it was. There's just so much magic and 
so many creative things happening and the world is really interesting and the way that the world is hidden is really interesting. And it made me laugh out loud quite a bit. And, you know, there's a big competition aspect of it as well. And there's enemies and there's, you know, unlikely friends and all these things. There were shockers left and right. I, my mouth was hanging open at one point and I just, I loved the entire experience of reading this. It is a five-star read. Book number two comes out in April. I cannot wait. I'm going to be pre-ordering it. And I just, this is a middle grade that you should not be sleeping on. If you enjoy middle grade books, pick this up immediately. This one's obviously staying with me. The last book that I read, speaking of competitions, this is a big one. <laughs> I picked up Lore by Alexander Bracken. I just wanted to read it. This was one that just, I looked at it and I was like, you know what? I really just want to read that. I want to get lost in a, you know, really good fantasy. And that's exactly what this was. This was very kindly sent to me from Jackie from Evil Queen Books. She has a channel. I'll link it down below. Thank you, Jackie. And this one is a young adult book that follows... Our main character, her name is Lore, and she is a descendant from Greek gods. So Greek gods, whole thing. <laughs> there are all the gods, there are all their descendants, and most of them live off of Earth, right, for the most part. However, every seven years, they have to come to Earth for one week. So every seven years, for seven days, they come to Earth. They are placed within a city throughout the world, whichever one is picked, and they all become mortal. The gods become mortal, their descendants become mortal, and they are free to battle it out to the death. So the gods and their descendants are trying to kill <laughs> the other gods, basically, because if you kill a god, they are not, they're mortal on the earth, right? So they they can be killed. If you kill a god, you inherit their power and you become the new replacement for them. And you pick your own name, but you're like the new Ares or you're the new Apollo or you're the new Athena, whoever it is that whose life you take, you take over their power. And when you are, if you're on earth, you're always vulnerable. So even if you kill them on the first day, you have six more days that you need to survive because people are going to be coming for you then too. But if you survive, then you go back and you are immortal for the next seven years until the next Aegon, which is what it's called. The games, if you will. So this has been pitched as like Hunger Games meets Greek mythology. And that's exactly what it is. That is precisely <laughs> what it is. That's the most accurate description I've ever heard of a book. And you follow Lore, who is a descendant of Poseidon. She is out of it, though. Like, she is on Earth. She's mortal. She has gotten completely away from everything. And she is basically been hiding um, because people have been looking for her because she's one of the last descendants of Poseidon. And she doesn't want anything to do with that world anymore. A lot of things had happened. She got out of it. She didn't want anything to do with it anymore. She just wanted to be a human and live her life in peace. No, no, can't have that, right? So the Aegon comes to New York City, which is where Laura is living. And she is definitely confronted with all the stuff again because it's in her city, it's happening. People are seeking her out, people are finding her, and uh, she gets thrown back into it, basically. And the whole premise of this is that the gods are actually trying to end the Aegon, they're trying to end this, but the way that they believe it will be ended is if there is one victor. So they are trying to take out all of the other gods, all of them. <laughs> and then there will be one left at the end. They are the victor of it. They are the only god left, which gives them all of the power over everybody else. And they believe that that is how this is going to end. And she gets brought in because she is the last of the descendants of Poseidon. There's something very special about her, all the things. She has something that they need in order to defeat everybody else. So obviously she is thrown back into it. Okay, <laughs> I was not prepared for how brutal this is. For a young adult book, this was very violent. I mean, very descriptive violence, blood everywhere, body parts getting cut off. I mean, battle scenes in here. So go into that knowing it. I would say like older YA, definitely. Um, I guess if your kids have read Hunger Games, they could probably handle this. 
but there is that. There's also a little, there's some swearing in here as well too. So be aware of that. There's some pretty good curse words in here, but overall, I'm telling you, I had a really, really great time reading this and I took my time with it. It is a big book. It's, and this thing is heavy. Like even holding it right now, my arm's getting a little tired because <laughs> it's a heavy book, but I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really, really entertaining. I liked all of the things that were happening and all the explanations that were happening. I didn't feel lost, which I was afraid of because with Greek mythology, sometimes I can just be like, what? But I think she did a great job explaining who is who and who doesn't like who because of what and, you know, kind of some of the history of it. So I did enjoy that. And yeah, I really liked Laura as a character. Um, I liked her relationships that she has with the people that are around her. There were some shockers in here that I didn't see coming again. Like I'm just, I'm enjoying being shocked by some of these books because I'm not really like looking for things specifically. I'm just kind of reading and enjoying. So that's been really great. And I really enjoyed it. I gave it four stars. And I think I'm going to hang on to this one, you guys, because this is one that I could probably see myself revisiting at some point. So um, I'm going to hang on to this. So Jackie, thank you so much for sending this to me. I really, really enjoyed it. And I gave this one four stars. I didn't give it a full five just because there was, like I said, I did get, I didn't see everything coming, but a few things I did. A few things I was like, okay, that's going to be a thing. This is going to probably happen. And then those things did happen. So it wasn't like, I don't know. When I was done, I didn't feel like it was a five star, but like a strong, solid high four. Okay, guys, so those are the books I read out of the six books. One was a Kindle book. So out of the five physical books, I'm only getting rid of one. I'm only on hauling one book, but the other four, like they were so solid in my mind that I want to keep them. So I guess that's good. Guys, let me know your thoughts down below. Have you read any of these books? And if you did, let me know what your thoughts on them were. Are you going to pick any up based on what I said? I would love to know that as well. And I will see you guys again soon. Hope you have a great day. Bye.